How would you handle this corrupt and terrible HOA? Board member rant. Yes, I do sit on an HOA board, but hear me out. I joined the board because I sat on the social committee and our chairperson wanted to move on and we didn't want the social committee to end because of that. Since then, it's been nothing but heck dealing with these people. Where it started, there were several vacancies on the board due to some community members complaining that the previous board just wasn't being transparent and they were taking votes outside of the monthly board meeting and holding secret meetings. Two of those people, who were the most vocal about the lack of transparency, were elected to the board, along with me and two other people. It's a seven-person board. Almost immediately, two people wanted to take votes and get rid of our management company and all of this other stuff in a special meeting outside of the monthly meeting before we even were officially seated on the board. The gentleman of the two at one meeting actually stood up and demanded a vote to fire the management company in 30 days. This gentleman was previously on the board, but quit after the previous board fired a management company. He lobbied to get hired because they were very bad. So I think his agenda was to get that company back on. Anyway, I called him out on the BS. How can you be taking votes outside of the meeting after complaining about that very thing? Of course, that made me an immediate outcast and put a target on me and the social committee's back. At the first meeting, what they did tell me was that I didn't have an approved budget. I let them know that the budget was approved prior to 2023 by the previous board. I was told that it didn't matter. This board didn't approve it. Prior to me being in the board, we had a Valentine's Day party at the neighborhood bar and I was accused of giving people alcohol and said that the whole event put the HOA at risk. This was prior to me becoming a board member. However, the previous social chair said that they talked to the lawyers and the insurance and because we were not providing alcohol, we were fine. This fell on deaf ears and it still gets brought up every meeting since. At one meeting, they were so concerned that our social events were putting the HOA at risk that they didn't want the HOA's name on any of the flyers of the events that the HOA was sponsoring. At the last meeting, I got dinged because I wasn't putting the HOA name on any of the flyers. Next, we were having a Memorial Day pool event. The Wednesday before Memorial Day, they held a special meeting and started telling me that the event was illegal. One of the new members was a paralegal and she has a lot of experience in law, so she knows. It didn't matter that this was like the second time that we've had this exact event and we cleared them before with our legal and insurance company. After scrambling the whole next couple of days, the lawyer and the insurance company came back and said that we told the board that we had sufficient coverage. Two members of the board came to the pool party and sat in the corner and just scowled. After they left, the fire department showed up checking capacity. Fire department come out on Memorial Day by just coincidence. I don't know, but it is shady. Also, at the special meeting, they voted to fire the management company and give them a 60-day notice. I became very frustrated at that point and I voiced my concerns about these special meetings and making decisions outside the board meeting. I kid you not, but one board member said, we are the HOA and we can actually do what we want. If needed, we can vote to change the bylaws to allow it. I was told that if I didn't like it, I could quit. I told him that yes, I will quit, but not until after the next board meeting so I can tell the neighborhood exactly what's going on in these special meetings and what this board thinks that they can do. I was completely upset at that point and I walked out of the meeting saying that I wasn't going to be any part of this. Apparently, after I left, they made a motion to dismantle the social committee completely. At the next board meeting, they took a vote on that and it didn't pass, but seriously, why wouldn't the HOA want to have a social committee? His family? So after that, four members quit. So there's only three of us left. And we already voted to fire the management company, so we have to do the business of finding a new management company with only three. Needless to say, I did not volunteer to do any of that work. We did pick up two new members who took charge of that. After that, it was somewhat quiet. However, two of the members admitted to never reading the board packets and didn't show to meetings regarding hiring a new management company. And then, they just recently decide to take one of those board members that quit 
back onto the board. Now I am being asked for a full audit of all of my supplies. One board member asked me what have I done with the paper plates that I didn't use. Well, they're asking for a head count of all my past events. I didn't take head count because I didn't know we even needed to. I have also been accused of again not having a line by line budget. However, I've showed them the line by line budget several times. Accused that I've not been transparent. However, I've turned in every receipt. The receipts are itemized, mind you. This is a $5,000 budget. I'm not going to get rich and live on some island for the rest of my days on that money. I am frustrated and defensive at this point. I've been accused of being just that, also starting fights, wanting drama. I just so want to quit the HOA, but the social committee and all the neighborhood events will also not happen, and no other person on the social committee wants to be on it. This sounds like a mess to deal with. It's a tough battle. You want to stay on to keep the committee alive, but staying on is a huge mental headache. What would have you done? Ridiculous HOA story time in The Fence is Wider on the Other Side, posted by Helpful Candidate 92. This story is something my mother did when they moved into the home they live in now. Where they moved to, it was a commercial apartment and condo place with an HOA. To paint the picture, this place has large six house condo buildings that were all the same and standard eight home apartment buildings. All the rent to own condos have a porch area in the back that led to a parking lot, some of which my mother noticed has fences. My mother handled mostly all of the getting the house ready and dealing with the HOA. She learned pretty quick that you had to get permission to do just about anything here. So after we moved in, she sent a request to put in a privacy fence, like many of the others in the area. With the HOA's approval and guidelines, she finds a contractor, which she discovered was an old childhood friend, surprise, and has the fence put in. Cue the HOA. My mom submits the contractor's document stating the kind of fence and collar and specs, only for her to receive a letter stating her fence needs to be removed due to not meeting HOA standards. Their reasoning, the technical term for the collar white of the fence doesn't match what they allow. Best example would be they allow paper white, but it was labeled eggshell. They stated that they would fine my mother for every day the fence stood. My mother attempted to explain that the specific brand only used that white. To get to the other white, you had to use a different, more expensive fence brand. My mother was peeved to say the least. She went as far to take pictures of all the fences, hers included, and demanded the HOA distinguish which was hers at a monthly meeting. They couldn't, but still didn't care. The paperwork didn't match. Thankfully, she had a friend in the contractor. She called him back and spoke with him about what the HOA said, and they hatched their plan. My mother and the contractor pull up the fence and the HOA watch as it's taken away in a day. The next day, the same fence comes back and gets put in again, and this time the paperwork says paper white. It's been years and my mother still has the same fence. The HOA never said anything farther. Those fees were never paid, but it's fine. My mom doesn't use the pool anyway. Should have just told the HOA the original paperwork had a mistake and said it was paper white. And then they take you to court, put a lien on your house, and forcibly foreclose it on you. HOAs are dangerous. Don't want to move your car for one day? Lose your convenient parking spot for a year, posted by Rashmasavi. This happened on the last 26th of January, and today the malicious compliance was done, not by me, but the committee of the society where I live. This drama conveniently happened in front of my window. In my city, the residential complexes are managed by housing societies, much like the HOA system in the USA, just not as horrible. Each society has their own committee to manage day-to-day -day affairs. Also, as my society has much more parking spaces than it has cars, it has no designated parking spots allotted to the residents. Anyone can park their vehicle wherever they want, but it must be a marked parking spot. People mostly just park their cars in the same parking spot just because of convenience and habit. Everyone mostly respects each other's spot, and I have never seen any confrontations happening because of the parking. So, those of you who don't know, 26th of January is the Republic Day of India, and all over the country, the day is celebrated by flag hoisting ceremony in the morning. The flagpole of our society, where the flag hoisting ceremony will be held, is just in front of the main gate of the society. 
there are two parking spaces just under the flagpole. All other parkings are further away from the main gate and you have to walk some distance to reach there from the main gate. The thing to note is that these two parking spots are very, very convenient for all the flats which are facing this flagpole. However, out of respect, people have left one of the parking for one elderly person whose flat faces a flagpole, and the other spot is taken up by an annoying kind of person who never moves his car from this place, else someone will steal his spot. If this person wants to get into his car, he just has to walk a dozen feet from his front door. On the evening of the 25th of January, the committee members ask this person to move his car for a day so that the decorations and other arrangements for the next day's flag hoisting can be made. Someone had already moved the car of the elderly person. However, the annoying guy was too frustrated about moving the car and first argued a lot with the committee people, saying that there is no such rule in society rule book that someone has to move their car for any kind of festivities and if you want to move his car, you have to write a rule in the rule book. After a lot of arguments and interference of other people, he finally moved his car. The decorations were done in the night, and the next day, a small but beautiful ceremony was held. And in the evening of the 26th, everyone in the society received a message that there was an emergency meeting of the committee. The rule book had been amended, and it has been decided that those two parking spots have to be converted into one, and anyone who wants to park in that one spot has to take prior permission from the society committee. As expected, only two people applied for that parking spot, the elderly person and the annoying guy. And today, the committee unanimously decided that the elderly person is in much more need of that convenient parking spot because of his age, and that spot has been allotted to him for one year. Now, the annoying guy has to park his car far from his front door for at least a year, pretty sure that he's not going to get the spot next year, too. He is not going to like this more in the coming rainy season, as we live in Mumbai, which is notorious for its horrible monsoon rains each year. All of this just because he didn't want to move his car for one day. Man Child of a Neighbor, posted by Smeximus with an update. Backstory, 22-year-old Mel moved into the new house my mother bought and living by myself while we deal with the old house. I'm taking care of all the bills. Started having issues when the neighbor who rents the upstairs of the house next to mine came pounding on the door saying that I was parked too close to him on the street and I needed to move. By the time I came outside, he had moved his car and proceeded to yell insults at me and then threaten me with retaliation from a notorious biker gang. I reported it to the police so that there would be a file on it. In the year that I've lived here, not once has anyone in the area shown any signs of biker affiliation, so I think he's lying. A couple of weeks later, I had a few friends over to catch up, and one had to slightly park on the street in front of his house, but street parking is first come, first serve. When my friend left, he found his windshield wiper ripped off and sticky stuff smeared on his windows. We don't have proof that my neighbor did it, but I have a pretty good feeling he did. Since then, whenever I'm outside, he will just stare me down and make me feel uncomfortable to be in my home. I've set up a temporary security camera watching the street in front of my house in case anything happens, with plans to set up a permanent system shortly. I just feel constantly nervous that he's going to do something else whenever I'm home. Any suggestions would be appreciated. The update. My neighbor is back at it again with his crap. While working in my backyard and can pretty consistently look over and see him staring at me from behind the screen door of his house. The across the street neighbor had company who parked in front of his house, so he proceeded to park in front of their house despite there being lots of space in front to still park. I had to park about a foot over in front of his house because of cars in front of mine and the next morning, after they were gone, he moved his vehicle directly in front of my house as some sort of power move, I guess. Tonight, which is causing me to post this update, he has company over that has parked directly in front of my house, again, despite plenty of room in front of their house to park. Normally, this wouldn't bother me, as street parking is fair game, but not when this butt acts like a child if anyone else does it. So again, I'm ranting but also looking for advice. I'm still looking into a permanent camera system to install, recommendations are welcome, and since my first post, I've also found out the landlord's information. Would you contact them to let them know what's going on? I just feel at a loss.
The commenter says an OP answers. Park right behind them and in front so they can't get out. Pretend that you lost both sets of keys for about three hours. OP says, this is something that he likes to do. I've looked into my city's bylaws and you can't park closer than 600 millimeters to another vehicle. Yeah, OP, I wonder what would happen if you did talk to the landlord about this and escalate this issue. Good luck. Recognizing the cashier does not entitle you to a return. Posted by I am Oster name Zero. At my store, we mix paint. However, because of the nature of the product, we have a very strict policy. Absolutely no returns on paint. Unless the employee mixing your paint royally messed up or you have a really, really good reason, a store manager will sometimes just return it for them. Cue me in. Working the night shift 30 minutes before closing. A lady comes in. I greet them. 10 minutes go by and I just see her wandering in the paint section. She looks at the mistinted section, which is discounted as they've already been mixed and cannot be changed. She's spending a lot of time looking, but anytime she walks to a different section, she's pacing very quickly. She seemed in a rush or waiting for something. She keeps repeating the process, wandering, looking, wandering. At this point, I'm wondering, is she just waiting for someone to help? So I call over to her. Hi, do you need someone to mix some paint for you? She responds, I'm good, I'm just looking for something real quick, I don't care what shade. I don't really know how to respond to that. Knowing the specifics is very important. She didn't say anything else, so I guess she just wanted to look herself. I went, sounds good, hey, if you need some help, just let me know. After a bit, she comes up with a discounted gallon, some paint brushes, and the whole shebang. I asked if she found the right paint. She beamed, yes I did, thank you. Cue the next evening. A few hours into my shift, she comes back in. I recognized her, and she recognized me. Came back in looking to return the paint she got. She says it's an exterior, and she wanted interior. I'm silent screaming in my head because I know how this is going to go. Ah, sorry, but we cannot return paint once it's been purchased. She gives me that look. I'm sure every cashier knows it, and then proceeds to go down the list of excuses. Well, I didn't even use it. I just bought it yesterday. Uh, it's brand new. Uh, I just got the wrong one. Now, personally, for discounted paint, since it's already been mixed, I believe the return policy should be lighter, but I don't make the rules. Sorry, but we still can't return it. She wants to get a manager, so I call one. All they're going to do is repeat what I just said, but with authoritative power. Every retail worker knows this situation. During this process, the lady was not shouting or anything. She was being very calm, but it was one of those confident, you're going to make it happen type confident. I've really come to dislike those type of customers. I mean, the rules are not going to change for you. After the manager comes and goes through the similar process, we reach a dead end. We're not going to return it, but she won't leave and just holds up the line. Out of options, she goes, they saw me purchase it yesterday. Manager confirms it with me. We both know full well that does not matter, but at this point, we're just trying to make any conversation other than dead silence. Uh, we still can't return it. She just scoffs, even though you saw me buy it. As a final attempt, she goes, I was just in a hurry and I got the wrong one. I, I can't exchange it for a different one. Both of us just want this to be over so we can help the other customers stuck in line. So we'd be a little more blunt. We cannot. As she leaves, she makes sure everyone knows, freaking stuck with $50 worth of paint I can't use. By the way, it was discounted, so it was actually $25, but I didn't want to stick a red flag right in front of the bull right when it was over. Ah, the old retail saying, if you don't like the answer, bug the people until you try to get the one that you do like. Dang it, Karen. Don't do it, please. Thank you. If you're in the building, you're working. Posted by Nifty Goblin. So, I used to work at a very big, very high profile retail store. I have a few good stories for my two years there, but this is the biggest one I love to share. I was a cashier and most often was supervising the self-checkout. My town isn't huge, so most of the customers would at least recognize me. If you worked a certain amount of time, you were required to take an hour lunch break. When we had our lunch break, we fully clocked out and had no access to anything in the system. We were also told that we were expressly not allowed to do any work task or help any customers while on our break. If we did, the store could get in huge trouble and we ourselves could even get fired. I did different things on my break, but this particular day I decided to buy a few things for lunch in the store and then head home to hang out with my mom while I ate since I lived really close. 
I happily procured my miscellaneous goodies, including a treat for my mom, and happily stood in the line at the self-check, waiting for a register. I had my work vest with me, but it was off and slung over my shoulder. When I was next in line and a register opened, this lady shoved past me, literally knocking a precious pack of beef jerky out of my hands and beelined over onto the open register. I was annoyed, but I didn't want to waste my lunch break and she wasn't worth a confrontation. So I just quietly picked up my jerky and made my way over to another register, which had opened up literally about 10 seconds later. I was just happily and quietly scanning my goodies when I hear snapping and a loud, hey, I turn around and find the same woman glaring at me. I blink at her, bewildered, before she says, Hey, I need help over here. I scanned this twice. I need you to take it off. I looked over and saw that my coworker, who was actually over the self-check, was helping someone else. I look back at Karen and smile and politely say, Oh, sorry, I'm on lunch break right now, so I can't help you. But coworkers should be free to help in just a second. Karen did not like that. She glared at me before asking, uh, why can't you help me? You're uh, right here. I blinked at her and explained that I wasn't clocked in because I was on my lunch break. I could get in trouble for helping her and I couldn't really even if I wanted to because my ID wouldn't work in the system while I was clocked out. Karen stomps her foot and insists. That's effing st stupid. You work here. If you're in the building, you're working. You, you have to come and help me. At this point, my coworker was done and had walked over to help, but Karen wasn't having it. No, I asked them to help. They should do their effing job. They're just being lazy. I just started ignoring the lady and went back to checking out while my coworker tried to explain to her that I wasn't on the clock and couldn't help. But she's not having it. This adult woman throws the stuff she was buying on the ground, leaving her cart and everything there, and marches over to the customer service desk when my manager was standing there. Karen then brings my manager over to the self-checkout and loudly exclaims, your employee was refusing to help me and being extremely rude. At this point, I finished checking out and was standing by the self-check exit. My manager just looks at me and says, um, Goblin, are, are you on the clock? I tell her, nope, that I'm just trying to get my lunch and go home. So the third person sternly explains to this woman that I'm not on the clock and I'm not allowed to or able to help her. Instead of going back and getting help from my coworker, she storms out screaming about how she's never going to shop there again. Okay, cool lady, I won't miss you. It didn't even stop there. As I was talking to my manager and a few coworkers explaining what had happened, Karen's husband comes in. He goes to Karen's register, finishes checking out and pays, and then comes over to us. He then tells me that his wife is in the car sobbing and in severe emotional distress because of how I treated her and embarrassed her and that, quote, I hope you are real proud of yourself. I just grinned at him and gave him a thumbs up. As he's walking out, my manager tells me that I should feel free to take an extra 30 if I wanted. I then happily skipped home to enjoy my jerky in peace. Believe it or not, Karen, retail workers do, in fact, have basic human needs and rights. You know, honestly, that Karen probably just went into the store with a t-shirt with gigantic letters on the front. It's all about me and I'm always right. Ah, no, you're not. Newsflash, you're not. Don't you think so? The HOA demands that I follow their rules, but I'm not even in the HOA. Click the video on your screen so you don't miss the fallout of this one and I will see you there.